in a world where trauma is real. Where people seek out distraction from their internal lives and relationships with others. And where no one is taught healthy self-care. Help was needed. In 2019, the mission began. Find a way to help people understand and better their mental health. Seek out ways to explore relationships and how they work. Fight against the stigmas that surround counseling and therapy. And, most importantly, do all of that so you don't have to be a therapist to understand it. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to Season 2 of Therapist Theater. I'm your host, Josh Treese. I'm a practicing therapist in Music City, USA, and every week a guest therapist, counselor, or social worker joins me here in the theater to talk about a movie that we've seen and what relationships or mental health issues it highlights. Today's guest is Kenzie Morgan. Kenzie's a counselor in Franklin, Tennessee, who works out of the Refuge Center for Counseling and also her own private practice called Arise Counseling Services. She works primarily with adults dealing with trauma. Thanks so much for downloading today's show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And while you're doing that, help other people find the show by giving it a five-star rating and writing a review for it in the podcast app. There is a place like no place on earth A land full of wonder, mystery, and danger. Some say to survive it, you'd need to dim the lights, raise the curtain, and start the previews. Welcome to the theater. Hi, Kinsey. Welcome to the show. Hi, Josh. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I am so excited to have you here. I like to start uh, my conversation with all of my guests just by asking the question, why therapy? Why do you do what you do? Okay. So let's see. My, I, I think it's a little twofold, so bear with me. The first part of it, I would say, would be the fact that We all have our own experiences in life. Um, And a lot of people that are in this field, I think we all have our own stories that play into what prompted us to even think about doing a career like this. Um, And so mine is sort of similar to that. Um, In high school, I had a couple of instances where I felt like I just really needed to have the support of talking with somebody. Um, Lots of uh, bullying experiences and several um, family experiences as well that really shaped what I was going through at the time. And um, in getting to a place where I thought, okay, fine, I'll go. I was a reluctant teen. I was that stereotypical teen that came in and was like, I hate being here and I don't want to talk to you. Um, and I was able to talk with, um, a really good therapist. She, Hmm. she and I worked together for probably 10 years, um, in total. And she just changed so much about my life at the time. She walked with me through a very, very hard time. And I genuinely, I don't know that I ever really, um, feel like I could voice in words how much that meant to me. So I came out of that experience kind of intrigued and, and curious about the fact that, wow, like if, if one person can really have that much of an impact on another person's life, that's really neat. Um, Mm -hmm. something that I never really thought about. Um, I had wanted to be a vet for a really long time. Then I shadowed a vet and figured out that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I uh, instantly, instantly was like, hmm, I, I don't really think this is for me anymore. Um, 
but in that experience of, of letting go of that dream, I guess, of being a vet, it also opened a door to think about other possibilities. And in that doorway, I guess, would be this different view. Um, when I got to college, I, I kind of went in undecided, did not know at all what I wanted to do. I, I had that idea in the back of my mind that this career would be something that could be really different and, and neat, but I didn't want it to be just based off of, off of my own experience. But when I got into um, my intro to psych course, um, they, they knew what they were doing at my, at my university because they, made, they had the head of the department teaching an intro course. And she was so passionate about the topics, about people. Um, she was just so intentional with how she taught the subject matter and she made it come to life in a way that no other subject that I'd ever studied in school had ever, had ever done. Um, I'm dyslexic. So school has hmm. never been something that's been so like super easy. It's always been something I've had to work very hard at. Um, and so in, in having to work really hard, I just never experienced a moment uh, in all of my schooling that a subject clicked so easily and was just super practical. Um, yeah. You know, what, do you think, and what do you think it was that uh, connected with you so much? Um, I think it, I, I honestly think um, it was just that the subjects that we were talking about, the things we were learning was literally walking around in bodies outside of school. I mean, you know, I was mm. part of what I was learning about too. So was every single person that I've ever met and ever will meet. And because of that, it, it encompassed the human experience of it all. And I think just getting to witness the things that I was learning, I think that that probably made it very real and pertinent. Yeah. So did it feel a bit like you were learning about yourself? Yeah, I think, I think with, with learning about, yeah, like you mentioned with learning about the human experience in general, I think we all have that moment <laughs> in any of our abnormal psych courses where we think everything is, is us. Um, oh yeah. Every disorder. I, I was saying to uh, somebody the other day, like, you know, there's multiple criteria for every disorder. And when we were in abnormal psych, <laughs> you end up finding out that you meet at least one or two of every disorder. At least. Yes. Yeah. And so I think that's hu the human in us, you know, we're always trying to see to an extent how it applies to us. And so, yeah, I was able to kind of, to learn more about myself and to learn more about my, the people that I loved and care about, you know, and I think that that made it just very real to me. Yeah. Um, I want to go back just a bit because you said when you were in high school, Mm-hmm. Uh, you got to a place where you realized, you know, talking with somebody else would be helpful. Uh -huh. um, and I'm curious because I'm picturing myself as a high schooler and I didn't have any uh, uh, idea of what a therapist was. I mean, I grew up in South Carolina, middle of the Bible Belt. And so like first, you know, shot at helping somebody was typically like go talk to the pastor mm -hmm. something like that what what was it that got you into a therapist's office was that something that you had an idea of that could help you did a loved one recommend it well kind of both and I guess um at the very beginning um, let's see very beginning of even thinking about going to a therapist really was probably my uh, parents, I don't really know. It was definitely my parents at the beginning, but mostly because they were going through a divorce at the time. And so during that divorce, they, they obviously were worried about us and our well being and everything. And so they, they took the three of us, me, my brother, my sister to a therapist originally. And I think at that point I was a little young to really feel like I a knew what a therapist was and nobody really walked me through what, what that meant. And I just knew that I was hurting and 
I didn't want to talk to any other adults about it because, you know, they clearly Mm -hmm. obviously don't understand. Um, And so I just remember not having a good experience in that moment. And then fast forward a couple of years, we, we moved and, um, you know, moved to this part of, of Tennessee and, there were a lot of shifts in that. So I went from a public school um, in a suburb of Memphis to a private school in a suburb of Nashville. Um, And just very, you know, it's very different. The whole atmosphere that I was around was very different. Any support system that I had in my old, in my old town really wasn't there anymore. Um, And so in shifting, I think in that transition, I just was not handling it very well. Um, it was very hard for me to make friends and I felt very lost. How old were you? Um, in that moment, let's see, when we moved, I was 13. Yeah, I was 13. Oh, wow. So it was a tough, yeah, it was a very tough um, age anyway to move. Mm-hmm. Um, just a, an extremely hard, extremely hard transition. Yeah. So, but I mean, I, I would say, I mean, you said you weren't, you, you weren't handling it well. Well, I think at the beginning I was, but it was sort of a compounded thing. So I think at the beginning I was hopeful. I was like, okay, you know, let's give this a try. But then when I got here and I wasn't socially having as much luck as I, as I honestly came in thinking I I would, you know, you, you're, you're trying to be optimistic because kids are so resilient and, you have this mentality of, you know, okay, I'll make friends and it'll be okay. And sometimes it just doesn't go like you think it will, unfortunately. Yeah. So, well, and I was, I was going to say like, you know, when you said you weren't handling it well, I, I don't know any 13 year olds that would have handled that, you know, in a way that you know, today we would say was well, yeah. I mean, especially, I mean, you've got, You've got your parents divorcing yep. and a big move yeah. happening pretty close together. Those are two of probably the biggest changes mm-hmm. that anyone, much uh, you know, much less a, a, a brand new teenager can experience in life. And so, mm-hmm. with I, I said to a client the other day, you know, unless somebody shows us how to identify access and process and communicate our feelings that we don't have a built-in like a uh, autopilot switch to do that. Somebody has to teach us those things. Absolutely. And I, uh, right around the same age, my folks got divorced as well. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think, and I, I hope this isn't projection, but I think <laughs> I can like hear in your story, you know, maybe nobody was coming alongside you and trying to help you, figure out what it is that you were feeling so that you could say it and process it. And that's, that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And so I think to pile on top of that, a big move. Oh yeah. That's really tough. And 13 is, what is that? Ninth grade? Uh, Eighth grade. Eighth grade. Okay. Wow. So then you had high school coming up too. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Holy cow. You are still here. I know. Right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Trust Talk me. about resilient. Wow. But, you know, no one is as surprised as I am about that fact because yeah. it, it was a lot. And I think, I don't know, kind of talking about, you know, people walking alongside. I honestly think in my experience, I had people, definitely people before I moved that were absolutely walking beside me in that were very, were very um, intentional. But when you move to a new place, it's uh-huh. like no one knows. I mean, no one knows your story at that point. So you have to be the one to tell them. And you've got to almost build new systems. Exactly. You have to build it all from, from the ground up. And I think, I think people did the best that they knew how to do at the time. But for me, it just wasn't quite sufficient. And yeah. So yeah, I think it, I think they tried is what I'm trying to say. They tried, they just, yeah you know, had the best of intentions, but also just didn't know what would be helpful for me. And I couldn't, I was so young. I I didn't know how to ask for that. And I didn't know what that even looked like. I didn't know what I needed. So yeah. And that, that's why I was asking, like, did you have a concept of what a therapist was? And so to hear that, you know, you had gone to see one a little bit, Mm -hmm. you know, earlier, it's interesting to kind of think of that as maybe a seed that got planted for when you needed it 
later on. Yeah. Well, and that was the funny thing to me is looking back on it, I'm going, well, see that seed though, that was planted in my mind was negative. So I didn't want to go back to a therapist. (laughs) I was like, I honestly was hell bent on not going back to a therapist for a long time. Um, I was absolutely opposed to it. And so I think it was when, I want to say it was when my mom just noticed that I was struggling. And um, we, I also, during that time, to tack on a couple of more, you know, instances, um, unfortunately, there was a, a friend of mine um, who was on the basketball team with us and, and there was a, a tragic accident um, oh. and she passed away. And so during that experience of, of grief and kind of and we, the whole basketball team was present for the accident, which made it that much more severe of a reaction, I guess, um, and traumatic. And so, wow. so during that experience, I think they brought in grief counselors and were very adamant about wanting us to talk with somebody. And I was, of course, not wanting to do that. Um, but my mom plugged me in with um, a therapist that was sort of connected to the school. And then it was in that experience where that therapist decided I might be able to benefit from, from um, a different therapist that she had a connection with. And so Mm. she actually referred me to the therapist that I ended up seeing for roughly 10 years. And I clicked with the other therapist pretty well, but we also had sort of a slight dual relationship. So it was just probably best to, to kind of yeah. make that transition. And it was so helpful. I, I don't think I'll ever forget the <laughs> going into her office. And I mean, whew, when I say I did not want to be there, ooh, I did not want to be there. I was so pissed. I was so, mm. um, but she, she let me be mad, which was so helpful. I think that was the best, you know, she knew what she was doing, obviously, but that was the yeah. best thing that she could have possibly done in that moment was just, let me be openly fuming and angry and have and, and hold space for that. Yeah. What do you think it was that made you so resistant? I think it was that first experience. Um, mm. In all honesty, it, it just, it was your kind of stereotypical, like I just looking back on it now, I just didn't click with that therapist. I just really did. Mm-hmm. And I was too young to know that not every therapist is the same. I mean, yeah. You know, not every therapist is going to click the same with every person and every client. So um, I didn't really, I didn't know that yet. So I thought every therapist was kind of going to have the same interactions, I guess, that I had on the front end. Which, I mean, I, I think that that is a, especially in the mind of a, a, a child, that's a fair mm-hmm. assumption because mm-hmm. Even as adults, we think, you know, I've got to go to the doctor. And we think in a general way about doctors. Mm -hmm. Or you look at like the jokes uh, or stereotypes that people have about lawyers or politicians or Mm -hmm. whatever it is. And so it makes a lot of sense that you would think, oh, my experience with this, this therapist is representative of what I would have with any therapist. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what my mindset was. It was like, no, I, I'm good. I know what that feels like. And I didn't like it the first time. And I have no yeah. interest in feeling that way again. Yeah. So, yeah, quite the quite the transition, though, coming in and, and then seeing the same person for roughly 10 years after that. So, yeah. 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 And I think that one of the things that I and I I feel a, a kinship with you. I had a very similar experience like when I was in high school really early on my my parents got to well separated and divorced Mm -hmm. towards the end of high school uh didn't really have anybody that was talking to me about it and so Mm -hmm. I think being a a teenage boy Mm -hmm. you know I had uh, a similar experience of just a an anger oh yeah Although I think, you know, knowing what I know now, looking back, it wasn't anger, it was rage, which is Mm fear-based. But um, so it was this kind of conflicting experience inside of, I really want somebody to talk to me, but I don't really want to talk. Yes, absolutely. Um, And 
And so naturally I waited about 20 years to go see a therapist um, <laughs> yeah. from that. Um, and when I did it, you know, I, I think I just felt understood and connected with <clears throat> and seen yeah. in, in a way that uh, helped me to understand that the things that I felt and thought mattered um, because I think up until that point, and, you know, to be honest, I think we all have default modes. And so this still mm -hmm. rears its ugly head up a little bit sometimes. Mm -hmm. But up until that point, you know, I kind of thought everybody else's feelings and thoughts matter more than mine. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I'm sure if I dug down deep enough, there'd be some bit of this, but I don't think it was primarily like I hated myself or devalued myself. I don't think I thought very highly of myself, but I don't think it was like a, uh, uh, something like that. But I, I do think I just naturally thought at the beginning, I'm wrong. Like my thoughts and my feelings are wrong. Everybody else's is right and they matter. And it just led to all kinds of stuff. And so when I sat across from a therapist and he helped, well, I guess by, he started by valuing, mm and accepting the things that I thought and felt. It really helped to show me that they were valuable. Absolutely, absolutely. I think my biggest thing was like trusting that somebody was on my team. Yeah. That was the hardest part for me. And I think that was probably the hardest part for me to relinquish as well. Um, like the control part of that. <laughs> um, and to trust that somebody really was looking out for my best interest and um, and that I had a place that was safe enough for me to be able to express what I need to. Yeah. Because um, when, you know, when you're a kid, you really, you don't have a lot of privacy um, by design. But at the same time, sometimes when you're getting into those teenage years, you need more um, and a safe place to actually express what you feel is, can be very helpful. But I think privacy only matters in the absence of trust. In what way? Um, well, if we're, if we're thinking in like a literal way, mm -hmm. right? Like a very physical, literal way. Privacy is especially, and I'm, like I said, like literal way, like a closed door. It's especially important if you don't have trust in the people that you're living with. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, and so to carry that into relate like relationships or the, I guess, metaphorical sense of privacy, mm -hmm. um, to have a person that, you know, it's okay for me to tell this stuff to, they're not going to go tell it to other people, mm -hmm. you know? So that, I mean, I, I suppose in that sense, privacy would be a person who's like legally bound to mm -hmm. not tell anybody. But if, if you or if I would have had somebody in our lives that we knew implicitly that we could trust and that, you know, they were on our team and that we could, now that's not to take away from the clinical work that was done, mm -hmm. but that's just to say that, like, I think that privacy is something that we place a higher value on when we don't have the ability to trust anyone. Oh, absolutely. And I guess, yeah, going back to that, for me, it was it was also this, this I, I mean, I was always very protective. I think. And so protective of what I said, because I knew that feelings were involved. So I really didn't have a whole lot of people that weren't connected personally in some way, because that is a unique thing about a therapist is that they're not personally connected in a way that's like in their personal life. So yeah, no bias. Yeah. And so for me, it was like, well, I might not, I might be able technically in my brain to know that I can talk to my mom about this, or I could talk to my siblings about this, but I also know that they're connected to it and they have their own experiences and their own feelings about it that differ mm. from mine. And I don't maybe want to hurt their feelings in kind of letting them know certain aspects of how I feel, because maybe that's contradictory. To how they feel. Um, so for and, me, it was, you know, being able to express those things without feeling like I have to censor myself. 
Yeah, and there's also, you know, let's say that you were experiencing feelings that were related to your relationship with your mom. You felt, okay. or, or one of your parents, I, I didn't mean to make an assumption, but like you, you know, were feeling maybe hurt or something. And okay. it's really, it's, it's tricky mm-hmm. to seek comfort from the person who you feel hurt by. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And when you're, you know, when you're in a family that, that one parent is, is really, you know, doing the day-to-day stuff, I mean, that happens all the time. <laughs> so it, oh, yeah. it, it's one of those things that that's kind of the reality of a single, a single parent home um, is that, you know, you're going to have your moments and they're going to have their moments and, you know, things get heated or said and, that's just kind of raising teens and raising kids. So it really helped me to be able to have a place where I did not have to feel, you know, like I have to censor or monitor or or perform or perform. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I get that. Um, is there any part of your, I guess, journey towards therapy this is a silly question now that I'm even formulating it that, that, that shaped maybe your specialty or your, uh, um, population that you work with now. Hmm. Let me think about that. So say the question again, sorry, I got distracted. No worries. Is there, is there any part of your story that shaped the population or your specialty that you work with now? Yes. Yeah, actually, I would say so. Um, so the population I, I, I usually see right now are people who have gone through trauma that can be relational trauma. So things like a divorce and, and how that has played into your situation um, and how you feel and what you've taken from that into your adult life. Um, but also people who have experienced um, traumatic events um first responders would fall into that category where they're, you know, they're seeing, um, tragedies all day long. So yeah, I would say it has shaped who I see. I will also say that it has shaped who I don't see. Um, so things like I, I personally don't, um, consider myself, um, specializing in, in working with children. Mm -hmm. I was a nanny for a long time. I've worked very heavily with children in different capacities before, but um, getting into my own practice and and working um, further out in my career now, um, I'm definitely gearing everything towards more of an adult adult lens, primarily because of, of the fact that for me, I just know that it is so much harder for me to, um, it's just harder for me to really be able to separate it when uh, it hits so close to home. Yeah. So I have learned that I, yeah. So for me, it, it shapes who I see, but also who I don't see. Absolutely. And there's not a single thing to be ashamed of with that either. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's emblematic of self-awareness. Yeah. I like to think so at least because for, for me, at least for me in these situations, I'm always like, you know, you know, we go through school and we talk about biases and, you know, how that shapes what we see in front of us. And I think for me, yeah, it's just, it's just hard to remain impartial when, uh, mm-hmm. and, and separated from the situation. Um, so I have no, I have no, uh, shame in that part at all. I think it's just knowing my own limits. Yeah, and why wouldn't you want to lean into your sweet spot or at least your strengths? I mean, if if you if you could work with children, but you notice that it requires so much more, yeah, I guess inner work, you know, fighting yourself at the time, yeah, and you find it a lot easier to work with adults, and you can be more present mm-hmm. with the client, you know, lean towards that, and because you'll be able to do better work in the long run. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I found that in even in my work outside of, of that with kids and, and with programs that were geared towards children, I found that I, I tend to gravitate towards wanting to work with the parents anyway, because 
the system that a child is in is just so important. And yeah. I just found that for me, I, I gravitated towards wanting to work with their parents more than more than them to help the overall environment. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's gravitate towards talking about a movie that works for me. Yeah, that was the best segue I've ever had on this show. <laughs> um, <laughs> what uh, what movie did you bring for us to talk about this week? Um, Alice in Wonderland. And I feel the need to specify the Tim Burton, Alice in Wonderland, yeah. um, because it is very different from the other versions and it's my absolute favorite one. It really is. I, yeah. I think that the title is a little bit misleading. <laughs> what would you title it? Well, I mean, something with a colon and then a, a <laughs> you know, subtitle or something, because I, wasn't this kind of this might have been the second. I don't know if Cinderella or this came out first, but it was one of the first live action Disney kind of, mm-hmm. I guess, quote unquote remakes of the classics. Yeah, I think. But it wasn't a remake. Yeah. Mm-mm. Yeah. yeah, it was more like a sequel. A sequel to? The original Alice in Wonderland. Well, yeah, I guess that is true. It was more like a sequel. Cause it, because... She she comes back, right? Like she she had gone to Wonderland. Yes, she had. And that was kind of what she was dreaming about, I think, too. In the mm-hmm. even in like the opening, you know, opening things. She's talking with, about dreaming about being there. Mm-hmm. And how it's very odd and you know, absolutely. So yeah, I kind of forgot about that part, but you're right. It does tend to follow the story further along. Mm-hmm. And then they made a sequel to this, which I actually didn't see. I um, saw that one, and it was very good. It was very you good. You said it was good? Yes. I liked oh, it a lot. Okay. Primarily, um, spoiler alert for the sequel, um, primarily, though, because it it was so neat how they, they basically looped in the story of how the Red Queen became the Red Queen in the first place. Huh. And a lot of it had to do with trauma. And I was like, yes, please. Interesting. After that, like she went through a trauma. That's how she was deformed. That's why she was deformed. And that's why her relationship with her, with the white queen wasn't really on good terms. So I yeah. think really was, I think that movie really rounded out the red queen and her backstory and also the white queen and, and kind of seeing like, oh, these are multi-layered characters. It's not just one is good and one is evil. It's that no, even good people can be selfish. And even mm-hmm. people who are quote unquote evil have their have had times in their life that might have led them to where they are now. Um, yeah. So it was a, I thought that was a really cool part of that movie. But huh. is it on Disney plus? Oh, I'm not sure. It should, I'll take a look. If it's not, but you should look for it because it's a good one. Yeah, because I mean, I watched I watched this one on Disney Plus. This I saw it in the theater when it first came out, but I watched mm-hmm. it to prepare for today on Disney Plus. So I'll have to check out the sequel. Yeah, I, and I I don't know if the sequel's on there, but definitely look for it. Hmm. Well, what is it about this movie that made you want to talk about it today? Oh goodness. So yeah, I don't even know where to begin with this question because. <laughs> There are so many parts of it that I'm going, yeah, just the entirety of it. Um, I'm having a hard time narrowing it down, really. Well, start, you know, my, my dad would always say, you know, the beginning is the best place to start. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Well, okay, let's start from the beginning. I like the fact that, like, at the beginning, it opens up with her sort of as a, as a child being unsure but also the fact that, like, I love that that they let her dad be in it for a little while, so that mm-hmm. we get a sense of who he is and what he's instilled in her. And so, one of my favorite quotes, probably of the entire movie, is actually at the beginning when he's talking about um, believing. He says something along the lines of, "Like, uh, sometimes I believe in six impossible things before breakfast." Or I think she she said that as a quote from him. Right. And he said yeah. at the very beginning of the movie, like she's referencing that when she's talking mm-hmm. about it later. Uh, uh. 
but he says that at the, at the very beginning, like opening scene. And I've always thought, you know, that's such an interesting thought, like believing in the impossible sort of makes it doable, you know? And how many times do we talk to people all day long who feel like what they're wanting out of life or the changes that they're trying to make are just impossible? You know, they come in and they're like, oh, they're strained. They don't know that anything is, is I don't know, doable. So they're, they're looking for that hope. In a lot of ways. I was going to say it sounds like a loss of hope. Yeah. And yeah. I think a lot of people, unfortunately, like you mentioned, like waiting 20 years, you know, lots of people wait a long, long time to reach out to a therapist in the first place. And so by the time they get into our offices, a lot of times they, they have lost hope. They don't feel like they have it to believe that, that something else could be possible. Um, some other reality could be possible. And I think that's what the beginning part of this whole movie feels like to me is that she's kind of walking through, going through the motions. She, she, to me, at least it feels very dark, right. From the beginning. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And she's living a life that she really doesn't enjoy. You can tell she's trying to like reach out in certain ways by saying what's on her mind to the people around her and for lack of a better way of putting it, it does not feel heard or seen. Well, I was going to say, it doesn't help that nearly everyone she speaks to is gaslighting her. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Like, I mean, she, uh, Humphrey, it was it Humphrey that was the yes uh, almost fiance. Yeah. I mean, to, for her to try to talk to him about the dream that she was having mm-hmm. and then even to try to connect with him by sharing a funny thought that she had. Oh, I just pictured all of the ladies in pants and the men in dresses. Mm -hmm. And he kind of just responds with, you know, oh, well. And his his nose almost goes up when he says it. Yeah. But like, you know, my mom, I think he said his mom said, you know, if you don't have anything sensible to say, it's best you keep silent. Yeah. Yeah. Which just sounds like the most condescending thing you could possibly say. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then when she's talking about getting distracted because she's she was thinking about what it would be like to fly. Like, do you mm-hmm. ever think about, do you ever have thoughts like that? No, not really. I mean, just completely shutting mm-hmm. down any possibility of, of a different way of looking at the world. And I think I've always identified with that part. Like, just looking at things differently than sometimes the people around you and sometimes people look at that and think it's peculiar or weird. And I don't know, there's just not a lot of freedom in that. I think the beginning part always feels very stuffy to me. Um, yeah. To where I almost want to like fast forward through it. I found that, <laughs> like watching it over again and almost wanting to just like, okay, we'll just, we'll just skip the first like couple minutes. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that when she was saying those things to him, Mm-hmm. that those were bids for connection? Or do you think that she was like just so detached that she was just saying her train of thought? I mean, I kind of hold space for both, but I think maybe she really was trying to connect in a moment because I don't know that you'd really, I don't know, when I hear her ask, like, have you ever had thoughts like that? It makes me kind of wonder, like, I honestly think she's reaching out and going, okay, who else thinks like this? Like who else, who else in the world can I relate to? I'm having Mm -hmm. trouble relating to the people around me. I don't really want the outcome in life that everybody else seems to want. And I'm trying to reach out just to see maybe if I'm not as alone as I feel. Yeah. And I think there's probably an element of it too, that she was trying to suss out. Am I quote unquote normal? Oh, absolutely. Like, is there something wrong with me? Yeah. You know, or is this, does everybody have these thoughts? Right. Exactly. And how many times have we sat in session and heard that, that exact question? Oh, yeah. Am I normal? Is this normal? Is this thought normal? I'm experiencing this. Is that normal? I mean, so often, I think we all just want to feel like we're not alone. Or sometimes it's 
hearing that when the question hasn't even been asked. Oh, I know completely. with my clients, a lot of times it, it first shows up as like uh, self-shaming statements. Mm, yeah. You know, I, I, you know, I really shouldn't, I, I shouldn't even be struggling with this right now. Or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I should really have this down by now. And nine times out of 10, you know, there's attachment injuries in the past mm-hmm. and it's, it's kind of a, you know, if nobody taught you this, how would you know? Exactly. Exactly. That judgmental part of our all, you know, that judgmental part of all of us, I think, can come into play in the back of our mind. And yeah, absolutely echoing the fact that you wouldn't know these things. These things are not things we know walking, you know, walking into life. (laughs) They're things we're taught or not taught. Yeah. So it sounds like you really connected with Alice at the beginning Mm-hmm. in in her maybe feeling of uh, disconnectedness. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And just the way that I, I think the way that she, that unique part of her mind, like working in a little bit of a different way. I, I feel like very strongly, I've, I've felt like that for, for a long time. So I think it was refreshing to to see a character that really exemplified that in such a clear way. Hmm. Like uh, the way that you think and feel is being represented. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. That she really embodied, for me at least as a character, embodied that feeling of like curiosity too, because I typically tend to be a very curious person. I ask a lot of questions usually, very inquisitive. And, um, you know, also a little bit more on the quiet side when I'm just meeting someone. So being able to kind of see in a character like, oh, she typically tends to get lost in her mind and I do that too. And Mm. she thinks about things differently and it, it kind of seems like sometimes I do too. So just random things like that about that character just really stood out to me from the very beginning. Yeah, and I think that's that's the most powerful uh, aspect of stories mm. is every now and then we run into one where we see ourselves in a character, and as we see the character go through their journey, encounter conflict, go through a crucible, uh, be transformed, mm-hmm. uh, make progress in their life or in their world, it tells us that that's possible for us. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And thinking about when this movie was even released too, it was in a time in my life where the transformation was starting to be able to, to happen really. And mm. so it was just a powerful thing to get to witness the progress of her character and to see like where she ended up. I won't get too far ahead on that one, but yeah, seeing where she ended, ends up in the end is is just a really inspiring thing. Yeah. So, what else from the movie uh, did you did you connect with? Or did you love? Well, I really okay. So, I really loved the fact that like it's very quotable in a lot of ways. So, like the the things that people are saying and the quotes that they, that some of the characters are are saying in the movie, it just lends itself to, for whatever reason, sticking into my brain, (laughs) Mm -hmm. things like the Mad Hatter. Um, I love that character so much because he walks alongside her, almost allowing her to lean into like parts of herself that might not be, um, I I don't know, socially acceptable sort of, Mm -hmm. not socially acceptable. So it invites her into, it invites her into that experience of, being around him and, and accepting him for who he is and, and likewise him accepting her the way that, that she is giving her permission almost. Yeah. It, so I'm going to, I'm going to probably butcher this, <laughs> this quote, but it, it's from um, Amy Alexander at the refuge center who, yeah. who you work with, but yeah. I attended a, a talk that she gave one time and she talked about how she looked at her work with her clients as 
uh, guiding them back into the library of their life and reintroducing them to all of the volumes of themselves. Absolutely. And I thought at the time that was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard in my life. Mm-hmm. And and Amy, if you know, if you're listening, I'm so sorry that I probably just butchered that that quote. <laughs> but um, but I I think that it it sounds like that is what the Hatter and Alice did for each other. Mm-hmm. You know, by walking alongside each other, it invited them. Uh, each to lean into more of their true self. And I think that kind of what you spoke about earlier, that kind of normalization, that kind of you're not alone, you're not the only one, Mm -hmm. it allows that to bloom and to come out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite, one of my all-time favorite quotes is actually from the Mad Hatter, who's talking about like, who who really asks Alice, you know, have I been Mm -hmm. mad? And have, have I gone crazy? Have, am, am I, am I crazy? And she just takes his face, you know, in her hands and she says, yeah, you're, you're absolutely bonkers, but I'll tell you a secret. Like all the best people are. And I love that moment because it, that is honestly how I view people. We are all bonkers in our own ways. All of us. Nobody can be human and, and get by in life without being a little off in some way. That's just part of being human. But all the best people, which is people in general, have that part of ourself that, you know, we need to feel like we're accepted and we're wanted and that we matter and that we're not alone. Kind of going back to that same quote, you know, same thing. Yeah. It reminds me of something Robin Williams once said, you're only given a little spark of madness, you mustn't lose it. Oh, yes. Was that, okay, question. Was that in Dead Poet Society? Oh, Can I tell you something shameful? You don't know, Don't do you? judge me. I've never seen Dead Poet Society. Okay, that was my runner-up pick. Put it on your list because- Oh, yeah. Oh, it's on a list. It's so close. To, to- here's, a, uh, here's some trivia. <laughs> Did you know that the author- the guy that wrote the book that the movie's based on, it mm-hmm. was based on his experience of a private school here in Nashville. I did not know that. Yep. I'm not going to say which one on the show. You but... do so badly, but I know you can't. <laughs> yeah, it's it's easily Googleable. Is that a verb? I don't know. No, we can use it as a verb, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was based on his experience. Uh, and I've got I've got a client who went to that school. Wow, Okay. That is so interesting. But yeah, no, that is one of my favorite movies. This, this, that was the runner up. So that's kind of funny that we mentioned that. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. I think that, um, that harkens back to, and, and I said this to someone on the show one time, I am shocked at how much of my work is normalization. Oh, absolutely. Is just helping people to realize you're not the only one. In fact, the opposite. Everybody thinks this way, experiences this, feels this way. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't have to keep it pent up inside. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's the one, I mean, that's the biggest hurdle for a lot of people is really coming to terms and realizing, oh, like there's this whole world of people that are experiencing on a base level, they might not be experiencing the exact same situation or the exact same circumstances, but we all experience the, the, those emotions that come up and, and you're right more than, I would say more than half of our job is, is basically giving permission for there to be other people out there that do feel that way. And we do see a skewed sample, so we're constantly reminded of that. But, you know, lots of people don't talk about this stuff. Um, it's hard to be an authentic relationship. And- well, I, I think I look at it as, and because I know that this is what happened inside of me, mm-hmm. this holding it in yeah, based around fear and shame. Mm-hmm. And it is... And it's a type of coping for the person. It's a survival mechanism. So I'm going to hold this in because I believe if I don't, then I'm not going to make it or I'm, which this is a 
paradoxical statement, I guess, in itself, but, uh, or I'm going to be alone, Mm -hmm. which most of the time it's the holding it in that prevents true intimacy, which makes you feel alone. Exactly. Um, Yeah. And so I, I, I think that I always look at it as even trying to normalize something like that, like a maladaptive coping strategy, just to say, hey, it makes sense. Especially if it's at a place in the work where we've been able to explore uh, family of origin stuff or attachment stuff where, you know, uh, listen, nobody taught you this stuff. So it makes sense that you would construct a message or worldview or a hardline rule to live by to keep yourself safe. Yes. And talking with, with people who are experiencing or have experienced trauma that is a huge factor because yeah. it is, it really is. We, we create these things to help ourselves feel safe and mm-hmm. anybody who is trying to survive is, is doing just that. They're, they're trying to survive. And honestly, looking at it in a way of gratitude to ourself for keeping us safe to get to mm-hmm. the yeah, I remember in in my own personal work as a client, mm-hmm. uh, one of my therapists uh, was using a model of trauma resolution uh, called the Murray Method. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's based on the work of this lady named Marilyn Murray. I'll, we'll talk a little bit after we finish recording about it. But mm-hmm. uh, basically it talks about, you know, uh, when a trauma happens, it kind of splits a person Mm-hmm. into the wounded child and the uh, survivor. And yeah. my therapist was doing a little bit of a experiential kind of mm-hmm. thing then. So she had a small teddy bear. And then she had tried to get a giant teddy bear for the survivor thing, but mm-hmm. couldn't find one. She could only find a giant stuffed gorilla. <laughs> so we ended up calling it the gorilla bear. <laughs> I love it. And at the the point of trauma, mm-hmm. you know, the wounded child and uh, gets harmed mm-hmm. and the survivor, um, almost like the opposite of a phoenix, kind of rises from that. And mm-hmm. the survivor is going to be uh, the protector of the wounded child. Yeah. And at some point in the work, I had to write letters uh, like every good client in therapy does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and... um. I had to write a letter to the wounded child. I had to write a letter to the survivor. And when I wrote the letter to the survivor, I I did exactly what you were saying. I actually thanked him. Mm -hmm. And I said, you made it possible for me to make it as far as I did. Thank you for that. I'm going to choose something different now. Exactly. And And even though the things that my survivor did Mm -hmm. uh maybe at the beginning were keeping me alive towards the end were hurting me right and even though that was going on I still thanked him I still wanted to honor him Mm -hmm. and I I I wanted to tell hey listen you can rest now you can take it easy take the rest of the time off and it uh I was kind of describing that to a client a couple of weeks ago as you know, just look at it as that was a tool mm-hmm. and that you really needed earlier on in your life. At the time, yeah. At the time. But right now, you are realizing that maybe it's not the most effective tool. Exactly. And so why don't we look at getting you a more effective tool than the one that you've been using? Yes, I have that conversation almost daily. Honestly, mm-hmm. almost daily. And usually I'll describe it in a way of, of, you know, possibly, you know, you're trying to decorate an office, you know, we'll take it very brass tacks with that. Trying to decorate an office, a hammer is a great tool and it's very useful. It can help in a lot of different ways. But if I'm trying to put together a desk, I might need a different tool. I might need a screwdriver or a drill And I might not be able to use a hammer for everything. And I might like the option of choosing a different tool sometimes, Mm -hmm. especially if if it is getting in our way and is not actually helping at a certain juncture. 
it's amazing what can happen when when we allow ourselves to pick up a different tool when we have choices. Yeah, and I like the way that you're you're even running with that because it feels very non-shaming. Yeah. And and empowering. Like you get to choose. You get to you get to find this other thing and choose to pick it up. Exactly. And that's kind of what everyone is is in search of in a lot of ways is feeling like they can move towards something that's scary and feel empowered to make the choice that's right for them. And I just feel that normally people who have you know survived trauma in, in whatever way that that might have happened, that's the one thing that they're lacking usually is the empowerment to know that they can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of, a lot of trauma, um, I'm going to use the word teaches because I can't think of a better word, Mm -hmm. but a lot of trauma teaches people that they don't have the ability to, uh, um, enact their own power to, uh, I guess a lot of trauma convinces people to have an external locus of control versus an internal. Oh, absolutely. And, and a lot of, I mean, there's a very specific reason for that. At one time, something was not within their control. Yeah. And our brain is super adaptive. It knows exactly what it's doing and it adapts in order to keep us safe. You know, and so in those moments, it teaches our brain something, teaches us that we weren't safe in that moment. So anything that even remotely resembles that, our brain is is doing what it was designed to do, which is to keep us safe and alive. And for better or for worse, um, sometimes that that part of ourself is just a little overreactive because of something that has happened in the past. Well, and especially if it happened during childhood. Mm, yeah. Um, when you don't have that experience and perspective and wisdom, which that that is a linear, like those three things come in that order. You have experience, which gives you perspective, which develops mm-hmm. wisdom. When you don't have that, you know, you create uh, rules or systems that mm-hmm. you at that time can conceptualize to keep you safe. And so you know, for a, uh, a child to experience, I mean, let's just go with something that you and I have in common, mm-hmm. uh, the trauma of divorce. Mm-hmm. It makes a lot of sense that a child would tell themselves, well, this was my fault mm-hmm. because when you're still living in with a purely concrete thinking brain mm-hmm. and you haven't gotten to that abstract stage yet, you're not, you're not selfish, but you are egocentric, which is not egotistical. It's just egocentric. You yeah. have a tough time conceptualizing there are things in the world that don't have to do with you. Mm-hmm. So if something like that happens and you feel hurt by one of the parents leaving or something, it, it makes perfect sense that you would say to yourself, this hurt is unbearable. I don't want to experience it again, so I'm not going to get uh, close to anyone else so that I don't experience this hurt again. Right. But what you're not able to get to is this experience that I've had is not representative of an experience I would have in every relationship. Mm-hmm. And so it, you know, when a trauma happens in childhood, I think that that uh, effect of teaching somebody or showing somebody that they don't have the ability to influence or uh, enact their will, I think it's doubled because you you don't have that in childhood anyway. Exactly. Exactly. There's already that power differential there anyway. Yeah. And so you just, it's almost like you tack on another layer of it, mm-hmm. another layer of powerlessness. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Which it seems like whenever Alice... Uh, tumbles down the rabbit hole Mm -hmm. it seems like she had been kind of experiencing a oh gosh is my life even my own do I get to make my own decisions all of these things are happening without me even knowing or choosing yeah yeah she felt I mean that's that's what prompted her I think in the first place to 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 say like hey I need a minute like Mm -hmm. 
I just need to get out. And so she does have kind of a moment where she freezes and then she runs. And that, I mean, you know, we all do that in our own ways. And so when she, yeah, when she tumbles down, she's, she's definitely in a place of, of, Hey, I don't really know what's going on. Everything seems upside down anyway in my life. Um, and I think that's a really interesting and beautiful way to represent that in the movie, um, mm-hmm. to basically represent it in very real, concrete, childlike ways. Um, having her falling up, you know, having her mm-hmm. everything be topsy turvy. Oh my gosh, I don't think I noticed that falling up. Yeah, she she was at times when she was falling, she was falling up and down. She was zigzagging. Um, yeah, I just think that's an interesting and, and beautiful way to represent how she must have been feeling at the time. Yeah, yeah, totally out of control. Mm, absolutely. And having mm. her succumb to the nature of the things around her too. So like even, you know, dodging things out of the out of the way um, as she's falling, it makes a whole lot of sense. And, and kind of coming all the way, like I love the imagery of her coming all the way so close to something and then being pulled back. It's like this, mm-hmm. I never know what to expect sort of thing. Um, and then she like comes out of the, at the very bottom and she's on the ceiling and then she just has that falling moment, mm-hmm. which is always humorous, but it, it also represents, I think in a lot of ways, um, feeling like you hit rock bottom and then <laughs> and then having a little bit more to fall. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Just a very, it's funny and humorous, which I think can, which is one of the reasons why I love this movie in the first place. It's serious in a lot of ways and it's dark in a lot of ways, but it also incorporates humor. And I think therapy can do the same thing, especially when humor is helpful. Um, I don't know. I just, I like that aspect of it a lot too. Yeah, I still remember the first time I made a joke in a session. Really? Yeah. I mean, because I, you know, when I started my uh, practicum Mm -hmm. and maybe even into my internship, I can't remember. I I think I still had, which I probably still have it in me now, but, you know, an idea of what a therapist was supposed to be. Mm, Yeah. Um, Tweed jacket, leather elbow patches, high back leather chair. Um, pipe, bubble pipe, bubble pipe, (laughs) say no to smoking. Um, but, and so I think that, oh, and then a lot of, uh, crossed legs going, "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, and I remember, and I've said this before, I remember having a realization when we were watching a video of Virginia Satir working with a family of kids, like, oh my gosh, there's room for my personality in this. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't have to be strictly cold clinical skills, Mm. um, which coming to learn how much of therapy is aligning and relationship building and uh, really creating the therapeutic relationship with the client. Of course there's room for your personality, but I do, I, I, it was in my practicum. I remember now, but I remember Mm -hmm. that first time making a joke and watching the client's shoulders drop uh, Mm -hmm. as they relaxed and going, Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. This feels better. Got it. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you're showing in that moment that you're a human too. Mm-hmm. You know, that you're you're showing your humanness and that it's okay to have the entire range of the human experience, which does incorporate joy and laughter and lightheartedness at times. Yeah. And yeah. gives permission in that in that moment. So yeah, that's the art form, I guess, of of therapy in general. Um, it's both a science and an art. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's definitely part of the the art form of it for sure. Mm-hmm. So Alice is in Wonderland, and that's all within the first like fifteen or twenty minutes of the movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So take take me farther down the rabbit hole. Okay, further down the rabbit hole. So she obviously gets into Wonderland, is having all of these experiences with the crew. I'm just going to call them the crew because there's mm-hmm. several of them. Um, And I love how in the, I don't even know how long this goes on for, but they all, except for maybe one of them, 
doesn't feel like she's the real Alice. They, they think they've gotten the wrong person. This isn't her. She's not, mm-hmm. she, she's not how I remember her or she's not herself. Like this, you've, you've got the wrong girl. This is not our girl. Yeah. And I think in that moment, I'm, you know, as you're, as I'm watching it, at least I'm going, but it is like, that's the real Alice. That's the one you're looking for. But even she is like, no, I must be the wrong person. And I, oh, that's interesting. Right? She is, she is, uh, hmm, con- God, not conceptualizing. She is aligning. She's identifying with what others are experiencing her as. Exactly. And, and I'm, you know, almost, yeah, identifying with the fact that like, if I'm not, if you guys don't think that I'm this person, then I'm probably not. And you've, you've gotten the wrong person because clearly what you're wanting me to do, which is to, you know, at some point in time, fight this big monster. Clearly that's not me because that girl doesn't look like me. That girl doesn't act like me. You're saying that's not me. So it must not be me. Yeah. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. Exactly. And so also I'm afraid I don't want to steal it from you, but like all of that leads to my favorite quote in the movie mm-hmm. when she meets the Hatter. But yeah. I don't want to say it. You say it. <laughs> it's the it's the you've lost your your muchness. Yes. Oh, I love that part. It's one of my yeah. favorite parts. Yes, exactly. You used to be much more muchier. You've lost your muchness. Yes. Oh, I love that part because it really, I just, yes, it highlights the fact that at certain points in our lives in general, on a whole, we lose parts of ourselves or we don't accept parts of ourselves as being, as being there. And so we wear masks to kind of be around, either be around certain people or conduct ourselves in a certain way, exactly kind of what you were talking about as far as being in session and not knowing if you can bring, you know, your whole self even into the room. So mm-hmm. it's, it's an interesting thing that we all, we all do. Um, but I love, I love that line because it highlights like, well, you had it at one point, so maybe mm-hmm. you can have it again. Which, I mean, let's talk about, I mean, that is a symptom of trauma. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, so I, I primarily work with, with people with addictions Mm -hmm. and uh, in the realm of addiction, we talk about negative and positive recovery, Mm -hmm. negative recovery being whatever it is that you're coming in for. Uh, stopping that. So like if you're coming in because you're abusing alcohol, negative recovery is how do we get alcohol out of your life? Positive recovery, that's the building. It's not taking away, it's building. So I always phrase it in how do we add things into your life that make Kinsey more Kinsey? Exactly. How do we look for those things that light your soul up that feed you in a true way to make you more of you, not less, but more. Exactly. And I think that's what the whole movie does in a lot of ways, like invites you into this, this idea that you are uniquely you. Mm -hmm. Maybe all of you, the real you, not the symptoms that, you know, we have built up, but the real core self, maybe that's someone we'd like to explore and get to know. And how do we invite ourselves into that experience of discovering and exploring? Oh yeah. I got chills. Yeah. And I think that that's emblematic in Alice's character because she (laughs) goes from a person who, when she tumbles into the rabbit hole, probably feels like she has no say in her own life. Exactly. To ultimately, towards the end of the movie, uh, finding her courage, finding her why, her purpose, uh, the thing that she wants to fight for, and then uh, with those two things, charging into battle Mm. and fighting for something that she believes matters. Yeah. Which at that which at that point, while she's still in Wonderland, is her friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then when she gets back into the real world, it's her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the, that's the interesting thing is like during these experiences, 
of discovering who we are and what we bring to the table, we then can bring that into other areas of our life. So thinking about the therapeutic room and that being a safe place to explore who you are as an individual or who you want to become. The One of my favorite parts from the um, eh, Absalom, the, the little caterpillar character. Mm-hmm. Um, I love- oh, oh, you mean Professor Snape? <laughs> right? I think yeah. every time I hear that voice. But yes, I mean, I love that character too, because at one point she, you know, she's talking about seeing him wrapping himself up, right? In his cocoon. Mm-hmm. And she says something along the lines of like, but you're going to die. Like, why are you wrapping yourself up? You're going to die. And he said, no, I'm going to transform. And it's a very quick little, no, I'm going to transform. And then at some point he says, maybe I'll see you in another life. And I'm mm-hmm. like, that is how I envision therapy in a lot of ways. We are transforming. Like we are walking together in this place of like really sacred ground and mm-hmm. towards a transformation, hopefully that gets that person to a place they want to be instead of, you know, the place they have to be for the now but becoming it's, it's like a, a season of becoming. Yeah. I thought you were going to go with another quote of his that I loved where she, she, she was saying something to him, uh, asking him about who she really was or something. And he, he answered back. Um, well, if you don't know who you are, stupid girl, there's no way that I could. <laughs> yes. That's in that same scene too. And I, and again, kind of going back to the, the humor part a little bit, like he pokes at her, you know, he's poking at her a little bit of like, yeah, well, if you don't know how, you know, how should I know? Mm-hmm. And I love her response to that because she takes that and she hears it and takes it in and a little offense, you know, is taken, but also enough offense to where she kind of goes, wait a minute. No, I've been told who I should be this whole time. Yeah, it shakes her loose. Yes, it shakes her loose and makes her kind of go, wait a minute. This is my dream. This is my reality. Like I can make it what I want. And I'm Alice. And she starts telling him exactly who she is. And it's the first time I think in the whole movie where you're kind of seeing her take control of her own destiny for a minute. Yeah. And also, you know, what's funny, though, is when she first starts doing that, she isn't saying who she is. She's saying who she is in relationship to yes. other people. Yes. I'm so-and-so's daughter. I'm so-and-so's friend. I'm yes. so-and-so's this. I'm so-and-so's that. And it's it's one of these things where I, I think it's, uh, I don't know, like I experienced it as a client in therapy, and I'm sure that I'm <laughs> visiting it upon my clients right now, too. It's one of those really frustrating things where you're trying to answer and the other person's like, no, that's not it. No, that's not it. No, that's, and it's this, it's in an effort to make you dig deeper and go, yeah, who's the, what's the true self that's not in relationship to others. Exactly. It's the poke, right? I mean, it's the poke that it takes to get any of us, myself included, to go deeper into our, into our true, our true selves and our true nature and, and, yeah, you're right. Separate and apart from from any outside force. Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, I absolutely love that quote. Well, we we got a little bit more time to talk about the uh, the movie. Is there anything else you want to hit on hmm. while we're here? Let's see. Maybe just like the ending. So having her kind of come back into that into herself and. I love the fact that at the end, at the very end, you see that, you know, blue, blue butterfly coming into play um, Mm. on her shoulder and kind of, she, she, I think she even says, you know, hello, Absalom. And it's that perfect kind of, I don't know, maybe. Symbol. Yeah. Symbol at the very end to talk about her accepting herself and being uniquely her, um, coming back into a reality and taking, taking more of an ownership of where she wants to see things go. So for example, taking, you know, taking the leap of, of talking with her, um, dad's, uh, I guess 
business partner? Business partner. Yeah. Something like that. She yeah. basically was like, you know, how can I be a, a part of, of what's going on here? Because she really believed in it. And, um, and he, and he believed in her and her ability to do that. Um, and she became an apprentice in yeah. that way. Instead of, uh, oh, so that guy was actually uh, Humphrey's dad too. Cause he says yeah. something to her about, well, if you're not going to be a daughter-in-law, maybe you could be an apprentice. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And he gives her that opportunity. And when you think about the time frame too, of, of what time this is set in, it wasn't probably very common for, for females to be doing any part of that or even proper. Um, and so she's in a lot of ways going out very far on a limb, um, at, especially for the time to yeah. travel and to go to these far off lands. I think she was planning on going all the way to China, taking the business all the way to China. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I just think it's a really amazing symbol at the very end to have Absalom with her. She had a community of people around her that, that was supportive and, um, secure yeah. base. Yeah. Absolutely. Went with you know what I thought was really interesting about that too was that the movie is the story of her journey of of personal uh, connection with herself and transformation into her true self, mm -hmm. and I think it was really interesting at the at that last bit where she comes and moves closer into I'm gonna call it her legacy. Mm. Uh, her family's uh, business, because I think that a lot of times, at least maybe in our first couple tries at transformation, mm -hmm. what a human does is they go, okay, I don't like this part about myself. I want to be different. So let me, like a pendulum, swing as far away from that as I can. Yes. And, and that will be better because it's different. Yes. Um, and I think that it, it's safe to say her experience in Wonderland was as far away from yeah. her normal life, her everyday life right. uh, as possible. But in the end, she actually experiences like this beautiful integration of the transformation that she's gone through. And she takes this change and she goes back into her world. Absolutely. See, that gave me chills because, yeah, that that is absolutely something that that you see all the time. Cause I think we think if, if, if this one side that I'm on isn't right, then clearly the opposite must be the, the quote unquote right way, um, to do something. And mm -hmm. I love the, the fact that it's in the gray, it's, it's an integration of mm -hmm. what she loves and who she is because it is part of who she is. She is this person's daughter. So she has parts of him and parts of the, his passion, um, because she, is his daughter or was his yeah. daughter. And so it, the integration is, is a huge key factor for sure. Yeah. And ultimately if we try to swing that pendulum in the complete opposite direction, the thing that we're running from is still controlling us. Absolutely. We still don't have freedom from it. Absolutely. And you have the downfalls of, of what the opposite extremes are as well. Yeah. Um, because usually the very opposite extreme they have their own issues with that within that too that are also just as inhibiting so yeah so uh earlier today i i subscribed to a bunch of channels on youtube of of like video essayists Ooh. and several of them analyze movies interesting and um oh yeah i'll send you a link to the one i watched earlier today but the mm -hmm. it was taking the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh, yeah. And it was employing this element of story that's found in this book. I want to say it's called Into the Woods, but it's it, not the play, but it's, uh, it's a guy who um, uh, basically like uh, autopsies and diagrams story and then talks about different aspects of it. And so uh, this video took the story of uh, the whole MCU, 23 films, Wow. And it tracked Iron Man and Captain America and their character arcs and how it was at the center of everything. And I want to hit on three th – I'm not, I'm not going to tell the whole thing. But, like, mm -hmm. the three basic elements were thesis, antithesis or antithesis, and synthesis. And so, basically, it started at the beginning of Tony and Cap's 
thesis, their kind of life statement, Tony's was, I do things my own way. Cap's was self, complete self-sacrifice, mm-hmm. right? So then as they go through the crucible, as they experience the conflict or the uh, resistance and they're trying to change, mm-hmm. that pendulum swings all the way and they move into antithesis. Mm-hmm. So they go as far as they can from their original uh, thesis. Tony in you know Civil War, I do things my own way to I'm giving over oversight of my actions to mm-hmm. somebody else cap with the complete self-sacrifice to I'm going against the system that I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. And then that's the antithesis. The synthesis is that the the last movie in Endgame, Tony ends up giving of a self-sacrifice and Cap ends up getting the life that he deserves, that he always denied himself. Mm Mm-hmm thesis to antithesis to synthesis and so what this guy in this video was saying was it was in the antithesis they basically exchanged theses and they the the transformation came because they met the person who is the embodiment of the opposite of their thesis yes yeah and and then that caused the transformation and then the synthesis at the end was the integration of both of those things in both of those people. Absolutely. Because Tony sacrificed himself in his own way Mm -hmm. and Cap got the life that he deserved and had always wanted by being a part of the system of the Avengers. That is so neat. I love that. And yeah, it really speaks to the whole, you know, interwoven archetype thing. Um, about the fact that these these stories and and that pattern is interwoven in in almost any superhero for sure story that that is there, but also can be sprinkled through almost any story that's told in the first place, including the stories we tell ourselves. Yeah, and I think that that same thing happened in in this movie because yeah. you know I, I what would you say Alice's thesis like her life statement was at the beginning. Mm, goodness. Maybe my life is not my own. Mm-hmm. So she comes into contact with the Red Queen, mm-hmm. who, who everybody's life belongs to. Right, exactly. So that, that's the representation of, you know, that that's the antithesis. Mm-hmm. And then through that struggle, she ends up at the end in synthesis where she has taken this transformation and she's she's also taking it back into her world. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, kind of thinking about, thinking about the parts, you know, the parts that we play in general, Mm -hmm. the fact that there was so much overlap between the parts that were represented in her real, you know, quote unquote real life. And then parts that were represented in wonderland and, and how those things, I mean, again, kind of like you're talking about that pendulum just swung into from super, super rigid to completely mm-hmm. loose <laughs> chaos yeah chaos and madness and then at the end came back in a really beautiful way of like how do i incorporate the what those parts of myself in wonderland that i experienced and this person that i've become into this you know system that's always so rigid well maybe we loosen up a little bit maybe we allow ourselves to to see the gray and to see where we fit in all of that. We might have to make our own, our own way, but maybe that's doable. Yeah. And if it's not, and it's certainly worth the effort. It's certainly worth the attempt. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how do you know if you don't? Yeah. Cause, and also at that point she's become right. So she's become who she, who she is or who she is in that moment. Um, and so it's, it's very hard once you've become to unbecome. <laughs> yeah. You know? Oh, that sounds like a line from the movie. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. I, think <laughs> there. I honestly don't remember who said it, so I have no idea where to give credit to that one. But yeah, that is part of it for sure. Huh. Well, I got to tell you, this is an experience that I've had uh, several times doing the show in that I'll watch a movie and I won't like it. No, <laughs> no. 
And then I end up talking to my guest about it and I walk out of the interview going, dang it, I got to buy that movie. I love that movie. (laughs) Did that happen for this one? Oh yeah, I did not. Okay, so the first time I saw this movie, hated it, hated it. That is so funny. And I love Tim Burton. Yeah? I love Tim Burton. But this, I think walking into it thinking that it was going to be Alice in Wonderland, the the remake. Yeah. And not knowing that it was a continuation. Mm-hmm. I think that threw me off. And so a lot of it was just kind of me fighting the difference rather than just going, all right, what do you got for me? Yeah. See, okay. That's the other thing. I always, if, if I don't really care for the original, like the actual original movie of something, usually I will like a remake or a continuation better. Mm. So with Alice in Wonderland, I remember as a kid, I, I didn't really care for it because to huh. me, it was just a little, I don't know what it was. I think it was boring to me in some way, which is interesting. And then, you know, fast forward uh, way later and this remake comes out and I'm thinking, well, let me rewatch that. Let me see what I'm thinking. And mm-hmm. I've always clicked with the overarching themes of Alice in Wonderland, but the original mm-hmm. cartoon version, I just never really got into. So that's really funny. It worked a, a little bit in yeah. awe for me. So Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I got to say, like, I mean, it is it is representative of personal transformation and shifting from a, and I realized I said these terms earlier and didn't define them for anybody that's listening, external locus of control to internal locus of control. Basically, external locus of control being things happen to me. I have no ability to influence or uh, change anything in the world, anything in my world, versus internal locus of control. I have the ability to influence things around me. And, you know, certainly this is Alice's story of moving from external to internal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I mean, th- I, I think it, and that's, that's why I love using movies as the framework to talk about this stuff with other people is because, and why I let the guests pick the movie, because if it comes out of their heart and out of their, you know, passion, it's really tough to not walk away at the end going, dang it, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it connects with you. You connect with a person. Yeah. And well, and you see a different, like kind of in talking about different realities, right? Like Mm -hmm. you see that perspective and you see a movie that maybe you saw through your eyes a certain way, but you're, you're not just walking in their shoes for a minute. You're seeing the movie through their eyes for a minute. Yeah. Which is a powerful transition, you know, in thinking about like, okay, the reality that I had watching it is so different from the reality that you had and how can we learn from each other's perspectives and Mm -hmm. get on a page where, I don't know, where we feel together in that, you know? Yeah. Connected. It's, it's perspective shift and it's empathy. Exactly. Partnering together. Yeah. Exactly. Um, well, I'm wondering, can you tell me something that you've learned from your clients? Oh goodness. Okay. Cliche moment. I learn from them all the time. (laughs) I really do. Um, But I I think take taking away, it was actually really crazy that this week I actually had someone reference Alice in Wonderland in session, which was prompted. Yes. Completely unprompted. Wow. I was like, I'm not going to mention it. Like in my mind, I was like, okay, this is the direction we're going. I don't need to stop it to interject that thought, but (laughs) But I was just so taken aback because I think she even said, you know, in that mo- moment in Alice in Wonderland where she like drinks the potion and she gets really big and she just, her, her limbs are like coming out of the, the windows and stuff. And she just feels like she's too big and doesn't have enough space. And I was like, uh, mm. I do feel, I, I do. I know exactly what you're <laughs> she was like. She was like, that's just how I feel right now. And I was like, what an interesting representation of where she's at and how she feels. And it's so vivid. And, Mm -hmm. and I just sat there thinking, you know, how many of us feel like we just don't have the room to get to where we want to be, or we don't have the space. And I don't know, it's just, it's the bravery of walking towards something that's scary. Um, And the fact that we all feel, I don't know, we all just, there's a connectedness in, in, in getting to have the honor 
of walking alongside my clients. Um, I, I honestly feel like I get to have the privilege of watching that transformation from the front row seat and what an honor that is to, to really be able to, to witness that. And they invite me into that. I don't, I don't get to force my way into that like ever. (laughs) And so they get to have this beautiful moment where they have to invite me to participate in that and allow me the ability to, to be there and, I don't know. I just, I think that's the biggest thing that I take away from any client that I see is the bravery to allow someone in and to risk, you know, I don't know, to take the risk of, of letting someone in and trusting someone enough to, to sit with you and walk with you even through a really dark, hard time. Yeah. And I, I, I like that you're saying that they invite you in I think that they invite you in because you've earned it. Like you've shown mm-hmm. them that you care for them, you have connected with them, and that you're a trustworthy person. And it, it reminds me of your why therapy and your first experience in therapy. You got the opposite of that. Yeah. And, and it wasn't until you, you went to this next person where you said, listen, I feel like I can trust you. You've earned that trust. So you, you know what it is? Clients are like vampires. They've <laughs> got to invite us in. No, no, we're the vampires. They've got to invite us in <laughs> yeah, in order for us to be able to enter. But it's, I, I think that that's, I think that's significant. And I think that, mm-hmm. um, you know, while certainly you would not have chosen to go through that experience because you know what it's like to be in front of a person that you don't feel connected to and you know the choice that you you I don't know maybe voluntarily made but maybe didn't of rejecting that relationship mm-hmm. you you know the value of I want to show this person that I care for them uh, uniquely as them not in like a cookie cutter template way but I care for them as a completely unique person and that they can trust me and mm-hmm. I and I think that that's why they are able to be courageous and invite you into that place with them. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, that, that is always my goal. That is definitely always my goal when I'm meeting with someone is to create a space and, and create a relationship that feels and is authentic, um, that feels safe for them to, to, to go there and to invite me, invite me in. So I always consider it a, an immense honor. Yeah. And I think that's the art that you spoke of earlier. Certainly we got the science in grad school. Absolutely. But we have to have the art. But if we stuck with just purely the science, we would uh, template match every client. We would treat every client exactly the same. Yeah. Be a cookie cutter factory. But instead of that, that's where we got to bring out our paintbrush and we got to employ the art of, you know, listening uh, finding out who this person is and aligning with them in a way that we meet them where they're at instead of asking them to meet us where we're at. Oh, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Because how many people in everybody's life expects, you know, all of us to meet them where they're at, but we just don't have that unique relationship in any other aspect of our lives. Like therapy is a very unique, uniquely designed, um, you know, relationship. And yeah. It's just a really, I don't, I go back to unique every single time. It's just a unique relationship where you get the, the opportunity to, to, to walk alongside someone in a way that is just different from any other, any other, um, situation that you might be in. Yeah. Tell me something that you do to take care of yourself. (laughs) So this is this. I read this question and I instantly laughed um, because I have really had to lean in to offering myself self care. Um, and so when I'm thinking about taking care of myself, it's actually a little dependent on my mood. Um, I have like a laundry list of things that that I try. You say that like that doesn't make any sense. But that. <laughs> That is the ultimate example of making sense. Of course, it depends on your mood. Well, thank you. I like to think that, you know, sometimes I I, I am logical in that way. Well, Wait. because where do needs come from? Needs come from feelings. Exactly. And feelings are, are, mood is another way of saying that. So it, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And that that is exactly what I try to do is it's almost like a, I view it as like a pairing. So whatever I'm feeling in that moment, like I might not need the exact same type of self-care if I come home and I'm really frustrated as opposed to coming home and I'm just really, really tired. I might need a different form of self-care. So um, I have a laundry list of things that I do, <laughs> to be honest. Um, when I can, hiking, being outside, those are always going to be uh, grounding for me and centering. I should say recentering, I guess. Um, if you're talking about daily things that I do, I do a lot of meditation. Um, I have a specific app that I really like. Um, but I also just will sometimes turn on meditation music on Pandora or something like that. And just really lean into, um, having a quiet moment because, you know, I listen all day long. So having a a moment to myself to check in with me and see how I am. Sometimes I, um, Sometimes I'm not always the best about that, but when I do it, I always reap a benefit from it. Um, and meditation what, is actually the what one. App, what app do you use? Oh, I use an app called Calm. And I actually, I was just about to say, meditation, I actually, you probably will find this a little funny. I, in grad school, at the very first, um, the very first uh, class we took, they made us do um, some form of self-care. And I laughed because I was like, oh, clearly never going to need that. And <laughs> you know, obviously thought I knew everything at that point um, in my life. And just, it was so funny to me looking back because I legitimately chose med- meditation because I thought, well, this will be an easy thing to like fudge a paper on and not actually have to do anything or change anything or implement anything. I can just do like a week get some content and then write a page, you know, a 10 page paper on it and not ever have to do it. Well, the, I was the one that got fooled in all of this because, um, about mid semester we were, you know, having to turn in our rough draft, uh, or outline or something. And I was like, well, I I guess I better, I I guess I better try it so that I have some stuff to write about. So I tried it for a week and use like the freebie version of an app and just um, just gave it a shot. And I had had a history of um, pretty, I don't even know, like kind of violent nightmares, not night terrors or anything, but definitely night uh. a lot of like just just kind of themes running through them that were just very heightened. And yeah. so I found that I did a week of meditation and I was like, weird my my five you know nightmares of the week went down to three and I of course the the analytical person that I am was like that's a fluke obviously because I can't at at all be wrong (laughs) there's no way and so it's humorous now looking back because then I did another week of it and obviously it went down to two another week of it it went down to one and I did it the rest of the semester and those nightmares went away. Huh. And so it's actually really crazy because now I've been doing meditation as a form of self-care and helping me sleep for probably four or five years now. And I very infrequently, I might every now and then have, you know, a stressful dream or something like that. But overall, most often they've, they've pretty much gone away and and it's a, it's been a very interesting process in getting more familiar and leaning further into meditation. Um, but it was, it was absolutely life-changing. And so it was kind of, the joke was on me the whole time because meditation has been really, really helpful. Yeah. I, and here's what I appreciate about, about what you just told me is that, you framed this in the terms of an experiment. Let yeah. me try this, see what happens, mm-hmm. and I'll evaluate the results after to yeah. see what I want to do with it. And after a week, you were like, hmm, more data needed. Yeah. <laughs> and you went back into the lab, you tried it out a couple more times, and you found that it was something really helpful. And that's that's something that I tell my clients all the time is mm-hmm. – when you're attempting to make any kind of change in your life, frame it as an experiment. Yep. Like 
tell yourself, come up with a, you know, a, a, a guiding question. What would it look like if I tried X for Y amount of time? Mm-hmm. And when you attempt it, attempt it without trying to judge it in the moment. Just collect the data as you go. And then at, after the fixed amount of time has passed, look at the data and evaluate it. Is this something that is helpful that I should care, that I can, if I choose to, carry with me forward? Or is this something that is maybe hurtful or maybe not even? It just doesn't help that much. And I can just leave it here and continue on looking. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it lowers the stakes. It does. And it I, I tell people all the time, get curious about what works for you. Like get yeah. curious about it. Without, like you mentioned, without that judgment factor, just get curious and experiment with it, trying out different things because I would have never known or never thought that I would be the type of person who would at all lean into something like meditation. But it took me trying to be, you know, kind of a smart ass to (laughs) get to a point where I was like, this really could be really helpful. And when we go into things with a level of like curiosity too, just kind of a curious bone, sometimes you can come out and and really have self-care, but also epiphanies along the way um, that allow us to, to lean into things like like meditation or even like play, you know, I'm kind of thinking about the movie and how playful it is. It is a, is inviting us into, you know, play and imagination, giving us permission. And so self-care in a lot of ways can do that. I think people just are afraid to know like what that could be or, or don't know where to start with it or think that there's a right or wrong way, you know? Well, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's possible to be genuinely curious without being open. Oh, well, yeah, that's true. That is kind of a uh, requirement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I think that, I mean, exactly what you're saying, if you can get into a position of curiosity, I think the, yeah. the consequence of that is that you're open. And when you're open, change is possible. Yeah. And sometimes I think, too, kind of taking that that – um, example for a minute too, you can go into something, even dragging your heels and the, the turning point is the curiosity. So like with me after the first week, I was like, well, that's weird. Let me try it for another week and see. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden that curiosity turned into this spark of, Hmm, maybe this could work for me. Maybe this could help me get better sleep and help me, you know, transform and help me decompress. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think there's power in, in approaching things that way. Um, so let's say that somebody was listening to our conversation today and they're just thinking to themselves, man, I would really love to connect with her and become her client. How can they get a hold of you? Okay. So I, I definitely have a psychology today page, but it is a little hard to find, I think for some people. So I'm Definitely at the Refuge Center for Counseling in Franklin. Um, if they wanted to see me through through the Refuge Center, then they could call the main line for the Refuge Center. Um, but also I have a private practice as well. And so if um, anyone was listening and wanted um, the email or the name of my private practice, it's Arise Counseling Services. And so it would be Kinsey, K-I-N-S-E-Y, dot morgan at arise counseling services dot net or my google voice slash office phone um is 615-461-5840 and please 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 um please leave a message because if not i'm gonna probably assume it's a spam call and not call back (laughs) leave a message letting me know. Um, I think any, any phone call that I get from that, from that line, I know that it's, um, either a spam call or someone calling in for help. So please reach out, feel free to leave a message. Um, and I'll definitely get back to, to anybody who's interested. I think any of us that use Google voice for our practices, uh, suffers with the spam call. Yes. Yes. And I always get frustrated because if someone doesn't leave a message, I'm like, Oh, I hope it wasn't like a, a spam call and you know, that, yeah. that's a dilemma, but I, I try to call everyone back that I can for sure. Yeah. 
Well, and I'll uh, I'll include those things in the show notes. So if you're listening to the show on the podcast app, you just swipe up a bit, and there's the show notes right there, and you just click on things instead of trying to spell them. Yes, yeah. I'm a terrible speller, so I can't imagine. Oh, me too. Know, and my name trying to remember that. always so <laughs> so I am very used to people misspelling my first name for sure. Um, but yeah, I want you know I want people to know when where they can reach out and, um, and absolutely people are here, people are there and ready to, ready to bring them on. Very cool. Well, Kenzie, thank you so, so much for being on the show today. It's been absolutely great to talk with you and get to know you. This has been wonderful. I just really, really appreciate the experience and the invite. So thank you for having me. Oh my gosh. Anytime. I can't wait for you to come back. Oh, me neither. Just let me know. When <laughs> <there>. <laughs> Will do. Thanks so much for joining me this week in the theater. I'll make sure I save a seat for you and a friend next week. Let's raise the lights, lower the curtain, and say that for this week, the theater is closed. <laughs>